Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and uh, very welcome to this Maritime Ammonia Insights webinar from the Ammonia Energy Association. My name is uh, Sophia fürstenberg stott and I'm Maritime Director for the AEA and the host for this webinar today. And it's with great pleasure I have uh, the two gentlemen joining me today, Peter uh, Kirkeby from uh, MAN Energy Solution Solutions and Yi Han Ng from MPA of Singapore. And so uh, the subject of the webinar today is collaboration and leadership on maritime ammonia. And so together with MAN and MPA, we will hear about a future in the making. Many are asking us at the AEA when ammonia and engines will be available. What ship types will be targeted and what kind of combinations will be available in the market? They are asking us about timelines, about performance, about costs, of course, and about safety considerations. And instead of giving you secondhand information, we have invited MEN here to this webinar where they can answer those questions straight away. And so when we reached out to, to Peter here, uh, we, we reached out to have a conversation about the high presence that MEN has in the maritime space, in the maritime media, not least, regarding pioneering ammonia initiatives. They seem to be everywhere. Uh, so Peter himself, he counts to 19 different collaboration initiatives related to maritime ammonia. And notably, we have the A engine project. We have the Custer initiative, which he will spend some time on today. Uh, the Itochu joint study and uh, the Trafigura partnership, the list goes on. And so we wanted to know more about the reasons behind such broad collaboration that MEN is taking and, and why that is necessary to make that future happen. And MPA is a collaborating partner in the Custer initiative and also in several other projects together with MEN. And so it's with great pleasure we have Yihan with us uh, here today for this conversation. So first of all, to, to any, new, any new listeners uh, today, I just would like to mention that, that the AEA is a global non-profit association and we promote the responsible use of ammonia in a sustainable energy econ economy. And uh, what we as maritime directors are doing is that we are trying to, to bring together the maritime industry into the wider ammonia stakeholder environment and, and bridge any gaps that needs to be bridged in, in that way. And so this is our fifth uh, Maritime Insights webinar. And we have the, the, the honor to handpicking select initiatives and projects that we want to illustrate uh, on how solutions are being made and, and, and how progress is, is going. And, uh, and we do this because we are dedicated to raising the, the level of understanding and connecting stakeholders uh, in the environment. Uh, and um, this session is recorded. The recording will be available on the website afterwards. The presentations will also be made available. And, and with some delay, allow our apologies, there will be a, a written summary of the webinar uh, as well. And before uh, we start here, I would also like to say that our next webinar is on September 15th, where we will, which will take us to one of the five Sogo Shosas, the Japanese trading houses. Uh, Itochu has agreed to come and speak to us to, to enlighten us on how they are developing their own business case uh, for maritime ammonia as a fuel through engaging mega consortiums on the safe design and deployment of a pilot bulk carrier and also uh, a corresponding bunkering study, which MPA is also a partner to. So uh, with, uh, with that and without further ado, I would like to, to, to uh, invite uh, uh, Peter to the floor. And Peter is principal specialist and promotion manager and business development manager on dual fuel. Peter Kirkby, please. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for inviting. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, hopefully I can live up to the expectations set by the nice introduction, but uh, let's try. I have a, a few slides 
five that I'd like to show you all. And once we're through them, then uh, hopefully we can get going with the real uh, the real part of this, the dialogue. So please send in your questions or comments. So allow me a few minutes to ensure that you can see my screen and you see the right screen and all of these things. Um, I'm sure Sophia, you will let me know if it's not correct. All looks good, Peter. All looks good. Very good. Right. So in MAN, we do many interesting developments for technology, some of it for marine applications. And in that umbrella, we have our two-stroke engine development here in Copenhagen. And as far as a two-stroke engine goes, mm -hmm. it's it's quite well proven so far to be able to adapt many different fuels. And one of them it might be ammonia, and that's what we're looking to develop now. So we started this a while back and are going through this development process with where let's say the there's a lot of preparation, especially when you are dealing with a novel fuel such as ammonia, where uh, from an engine point of view, it's it's not the best, should we say, uh, fuel as such. It does, it's not very willing to ignite. And there's also the whole safety consideration. We need to make sure that we engineer a system that, that, that can handle a toxic substance on board a ship. Um, so the engine is part of that. Of course, there's the ship design and many other stakeholders in that. But coming back to this timeline, where we are now is that in a few months, we'll have our engine running here in Copenhagen on ammonia. So that is a 50 bore. That's a fairly large two-stroke engine running on one cylinder with ammonia. And part of that development process is also running on all cylinders, uh, all four of them on our engine next year. and then. Year after 2024, we are hoping that or looking at the first engine delivered to a shipyard. So this is the timeline we're working with. But today's topic is slightly different than pistons and valves. So let's move on to that. As you mentioned, Sophia, we are now in 19 different uh, joint industry projects or studies or alliances, what you want to call them, where we have really the entire spectrum of stakeholders talking together, trying to develop, uh, not, of course we need to develop the engine, but everything else surrounding uh, a ship needs to be matured as well. Uh, that's regulation, operational, um, uh, let's say rules or standards. Uh, it's how do you bunker, all of those things. And uh, we need to, discuss it, have a have forums where we can discuss this with other industry partners. Uh, we also need to talk openly about what we do with safety, since it is a very big concern, of course. And we also have to remember that a brand new fuel supply chain has to be developed, and we need to make sure that we talk about what can be done and at which time so that the infrastructure can, can follow, uh, let's say, the the development of the ships. And I'll say we have found an enormous uh, interest in joining these studies. And we have seen many, many different stakeholders, which we would usually probably not discuss as much with, uh, join some of these. So today I'd uh, focus a little bit on the Castor Initiative, which is one of the 19, um, of course. Um, we have MPA in this, uh, in this Castor initiative as well. And uh, I will leave to Ian to, to talk more about that. But our role is of course the engine technology, as engine technology provider. Um, the engine is only a small component in the ship. So we have Samsung Heavy Industries to do the ship design and eventually they, they, they will build ships uh, fueled by ammonia. We have a classification, we have a ship owner, and an ammonia producer, and actually also Jurong Port, which of course is the terminal, uh, one of the terminals in Singapore. So it's really um, quite a broad um, 
broad field of uh, stakeholders in this and and not something we have seen with let's say other no novel fuels that we brought together this many uh, or this wide uh, context of state stakeholders so again the cast our project this is basically what what we what is being targeted to go through all the steps so that a shipbuilding contract can be signed in 2024 you can say that the shipbuilding contract is uh, you can design a ship but if the rules and the bunkering operation and the supply chain isn't in place then there's no point in doing that but that's that's what we are looking at here to make sure that all of these things are in place so that it makes sense to sign such a contract in 2024 that is really the caster initiative and actually that was all from my side uh, i will uh, pitch back to you sofia and hopefully thank you peter start getting some questions yes that's that's perfect and isn't it, isn't it so, and we are not taking questions now, but isn't it so that uh, the Custer initiative is, is almost like, like a catalyst for a catalyst of a project exploring decarbonization pathways uh, to spur others to, to, to go on a similar path. That's what I have understood and what I think is really great with this initiative. Um, I see some nodding from Jihan, so hopefully I'm not totally wrong. So, so without further ado then, uh, and I didn't give you a proper introduction, Jihan, you are the Director for Innovation, Technology and Talent Development in MPA in Singapore. So uh, we are ready for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Yeah, good morning, uh, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, uh, everyone. Uh, and welcome uh, uh, to join us online in this uh, webinar. So I would like to first thank uh, the organizers, uh, Sophia and Julian, for inviting uh, both of us uh, to speak and also for inviting, uh, in particular, MPA to share about our MPA initiatives in maritime decarbonization. Uh, next slide, please. So let me just do a quick uh, snapshot uh, of Maritime Singapore just to give an overview. So many of you will be familiar with some of the performance and statistics uh, of our port. Uh, so uh, just to highlight, Singapore is host to more than 170 international shipping groups and some 5,000 maritime companies. So the Singapore Registry of Ships is the fifth largest uh, ship registry in the world. Uh, they are our commercial and technology demand drivers. And within our port, at any point in time, you can find some 1,000 vessels uh, doing operations or waiting in Anchorage. Most of here, most of them are here for cargo operations uh, or port marine services, including bunkering. And this is also why uh, uh, Singapore is well positioned favorably to be the top bunkering port in the world, as well as to play a key role uh, to support the global shipping community in this maritime energy transition. Next slide, please. Earlier this year, MPA released the Maritime Singapore Decolonization Blueprint 2050. So the blueprint is on board the recommendation made by the International Advisory Panel on Maritime Decolonization. And uh, we have also sought inputs from both the public and the industry stakeholders uh, to be incorporated into this blueprint. So it charts our ambitions as well as our long-term strategies to build a sustainable Maritime Singapore aligned with uh, IMO goals and uh, ambition. So the blueprint actually outlines uh, seven areas that Singapore will focus on to support the industry to decarbonize. Under the blueprint, we have set uh, concrete goals and targets to reduce the emissions from our port terminals, domestic hovercrafts, and we also support a multi-fuel transition to supply low and zero carbon fuel uh, in the industry and to enable the use of green technologies. So green ships on the Singapore Registry of Ships will also be recognized and incentivized. So we think that uh, cross-sector collaboration across the energy and shipping value chain is key. And this is also why you know, we, we reach out and work with our parties like uh, our men in, in this space. We work also with uh, the IMO as well as other like-minded international platforms to develop and establish standards. And it is important to support and encourage uh, the development, uptake, and also commercialization of green fuels and technologies. So to that, uh, we have also been working very closely with our research partners to intensify investments and efforts in this space, uh, supporting R&D, working with the industry as well as the global stakeholders. 
Uh, last but not least, we also want to build up industry capabilities in carbon accounting and green financing. So this will actually help to drive the awareness and capability part. And uh, of course, uh, to deliver all this, uh, we, we are committing an additional 300 million Singapore dollars to support the various different uh, efforts and, uh, for the next 10 years. So next slide, please. So as the top uh, global bunkering hub hot, uh, MPA is preparing for a multi-fuel transition to support international shipping, as I shared earlier under the blueprint. Uh, we see hydrogen and hydrogen such as methanol and ammonia as important marine fuels in the energy transition. As such, MPA has also participated in various green uh, shipping consortiums such, such as the Castor Initiative, the Itochu Consortium, the Saber Consortium, as well as the Eastern Pacific Shipping Consortium. Uh, all, are, all consortiums are looking into the use of ammonia as uh, fuel for shipping. Uh, we are also facilitating uh, green or e-methanol initiatives for shipping as well. So all these complements our existing efforts in uh, uh, building up the uh, LNG bunkering activities, which is the immediate direct way to reduce carbon emissions today. Uh, so we see that uh, in addition to LNG, all these uh, new fuels and as well as the use of biofuels are part of this multi-fuel approach towards helping the industry decarbonize immediately in the short term as well as building up capabilities uh, for a deeper, greater reduction in the longer term. Beyond moving to uh, cleaner fuel, I'd also like to highlight that uh, MPA is also working with the industry to develop shipboard carbon capture technologies, optimize uh, ship performance using other technologies such as uh, air lubrication, weather routing, for example. And we are also working on uh, enhancing ship port interfaces, uh, such as uh, using digitalization to enable just-in-time port calls and our port, call, uh, port operations. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot in terms of you know the various different joint industry project that uh, has been undertaken in Singapore. I uh, just wanted to highlight that you know the approach you know to address some of these uh, very challenging industry issues and complex issues is really to bring on board uh, the key stakeholders that are involved across the value chain in order to tackle it uh, together collectively instead of uh, uh, the different party working it on a piecemeal or a silo basis. Next slide, please. So MPA is uh, glad to support and facilitate the activities of green shipping consortiums in Singapore. We see this as an effective way to establish green fuel supply chain uh, through Singapore, bring together demand users, the fuel suppliers, as well as technology providers. So the ammonia consortium in this like comprises on a value chain and ecosystem approach, bring together key stakeholders which will enable uh, us to move forward you know, uh, from our plans uh, and ambition uh, towards uh, reality. Uh, next slide, please. So the pathway to decarbonization in our view is not straightforward. So we have worked with uh, various different partners in this journey as early as in the early 2010s. Uh, so we have established the Center of Excellence in Maritime Energy and Sustainability Development in the Nanyang Technological University. So this uh, was our starting ground to deepen our R&D capability in this area and develop green technologies. Uh, last year, uh, MPA together with six other companies established the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization or GCMD, as you have heard of them. Uh, MPA uh, has uh, provided uh, together with the private sector partners a total of uh, 155 million Singapore dollars to support projects to help the industry decarbonize and eliminate greenhouse emission uh, in their operations. So GCMD is an instrumental partner to the industry consortium seeking to pursue uh, R&D and conduct pilot trials uh, in Singapore as well as overseas. So we welcome uh, industry consortium to reach out to us or our partners to, to pursue uh, such a, some of this work and pilots. And there, we, there goes uh, to my last slide, which uh, I would like to just end off my sharing by sh just showcasing you know, this uh, green technology ecosystem that we have built up in Singapore over time. This really comprises you know, a, a wide range of different parties uh, in the different spaces. And we feel that you know, uh, it is important you know, to have all the different components here uh, to act on such a pressing and complex issues such as decarbonization. And um, that's all for my presentation. Uh, very happy to hear and uh, questions and taking feedback uh, from uh, the participants today. Thank you. 
Ihan, thank you so much. That's that's fantastic. Um, I want to be there too. I want to be on your map there on your last page. <laughs> it's a uh, it's great to see. And um, notably, there you you have uh, the GCMD, which we actually had here for for one of the previous webinars, where they shared with us the progress on on the ammonia bunkering safety study that is taking place uh, over there. So. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, so I have the privilege to, to start the, the questions here, but, but while I'll uh, get you warmed up, I encourage all of you uh, participants to, to share your questions in the, the Q&A um, tab here on the screen. And uh, we have also received some questions um, prior um, that I will pick and choose from as well. But I would like to, to start with, with you, Peter. And uh, uh, you presented to us the progress on your, on your timeline on the, on the energy development. And, and if I'm not mistaken, your, your very ambitious uh, schedule was, was kind of communicated at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, you are kind of halfway through that timeline now. And uh, uh, I would like to start with a rather big question, of course, but uh, I work with a lot with, with uh, industry collaboration uh, myself, so maybe I have some personal interest here as well. But if you could just pick uh, a few key learnings you have had on this, this journey to, to get these engines uh, developed and, and, and ready and through all the collaborative initiatives that you are engaging in, what have the greatest learnings been from, from, from this industry collaborative uh, point of view? What have your biggest learnings been and, and what, what has it, is it also difficult? What, what, what have the biggest kind of drawbacks been in, in, in this, uh, in your ambition to, to progress uh, these engines uh, through collaborative efforts? I would say that uh, for sure COVID has been the biggest uh, <laughs> challenge, uh, but it has also shown how much we depend on, of course, supply chains, but also being able to meet and discuss all these things. Um, one of the big learnings is actually that we, when we were designing our test plant, we actually found that our discussions with another uh, let's say shore-based ammonia facility let them well we we found out we had to upgrade to a certain uh, a certain uh, let's say safety precaution in 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 what we were establishing but we actually saw that this shore-based plants that we had been discussing with and trying to learn with found they had to do the same sort of, of uh, extra initiative regarding their safety systems basically learning from each other in this process even though we I've said it, and, and maybe you have as well, Sophia, that, well, ammonia is a well-known substance that has been handled for long. It just goes to show that if you discuss with all the right partners, you always learn something. Yeah. Have you, have you had any particular drawbacks that you were able to share with us? Um, we have had uh, them all, but... <laughs> I think everyone has these days. So anything from COVID making it difficult to to meet the right business partners, COVID making it difficult to discuss the, all the technical details, um, the supply chains uh, tightening up a lot, um, and of course personnel um, yeah. being either uh, ill with COVID, not being able to to work, or those same resources because quarantine. We do a lot of testing in, in Asia, but also in Copenhagen, and those are the same people we rely on. And we've seen that when we all of a sudden have to put people in quarantine for, for a few weeks, each end of such a trip, then, then all of those man hours are missing in yeah. uh, both in, in Copenhagen, but obviously they've also been missing on the other end in Asia. So, yes. Yes, of course. That's a totally different aspect, uh, and we we may not think about that too much over here as well. Um, and um, thank you for that, um, Peter. You 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 mentioned that um, 
you uh, you need to have brand new fuel supply chains being developed uh, and this requires uh, collaboration uh, there is a lot of collaboration upstream with with energy producers um, not only for for MEN's sake but in many of these pioneering um, maritime ammonia projects we we see uh, energy producers being part um, why is this important and from your perspective i'll say from uh, we actually don't use a whole lot of fuel for testing <laughs> so it's not so much for us obviously as it is for the ship operators um, but the ship operators are of course there will be the strategic pilot developments and to showcase this can be done and to lead the way but but really for for the large scale pickup of, of uh, our technology but let's say ammonia as a fuel uh, it's the ship owners who need to be reassured that that the supply chain can be built fast enough uh, or let's say as fast as they need it for their ships and having these forums where we let's say we we can share quite openly our timelines but at the same time someone is looking at the ammonia producers and they can show how fast can they actually scale their existing uh, well let's say not their existing production but in their uh, existing infrastructure when can they start dropping uh, green ammonia into that one yeah. so having these open discussions really helps map out what is possible at which time how how important are these broad collaborations for MEN in order to reduce your own risk? I'd say these, the more you know, the less risk you have. And you also become aware of what, what risks you actually do have. And, and that's where we use these a lot. It's extremely important to know, well, if, I, if we can talk to Ihan about what Singapore is doing on regulation, um, if there's a misunderstanding there that, that we wouldn't have discovered until it was quite late in the process, yeah. then maybe whatever we're developing would not be compatible with the regulation or vice versa. So this is all new ground. We need to be able to talk so that we don't end up making small roadblocks for each other in the yeah. Thank you. Turn, turning to you, Jihan, and maybe a bit of a similar question. The MPA, you are continuously playing a crucial role uh, to advance uh, multi-fuel maritime innovations. And um, um, you clearly playing a central role, as we could see in your presentation here. Um, what, what have, from your perspective, um, been your biggest learnings so far? to support the development of maritime ammonia? What, 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 are, what are the successes and what are the drawbacks um, that you can see? Yeah, thanks, Sophia, for the question. So in terms of uh, what are the biggest learnings that the MPA has uh, for, uh, from being involved in all this consortium work, I would say that there are many uh, useful benefits. Of course, uh, one is really to have a close uh, pulse of uh, what the industry is thinking and uh, expectation in terms of the demand, uh, demand and supply. Uh, uh, understanding of uh, the developmental time frame, you know, as what uh, uh, Peter has shared earlier, you know, we get a very good uh, detailed updates in terms of you know how the the, the technology is going, you know, where, where where are the big steps that we need to come in, uh, whether it is at the national level or, or working with some of our uh, international parties, you know, to to address some of these issues. So the timeline part is very important as uh, as it relates uh, to uh, infrastructure planning. Uh, policy planning, uh, especially relating to the licensing of uh, such uh, activities towards the bunkering side, uh, that will form, you know, the overall assessment uh, of uh, the use and the uh, resources that is needed to support ammonia uh, bunkering uh, in the port of Singapore. So I'm also trying to address one of the comments from one of the attendee that has raised to us in terms of uh, what is the storage capacity that we are looking at uh, to install here in Singapore. I would say that this is still an uh, early part of the stage uh, 
uh, for us, uh, I think the consortiums are still uh, working out uh, their uh, development plans and studies. So uh, that actually helps us to have a sense in terms of whether we are looking at uh, the pickup uh, uh, phasing and whether we are looking at some degree of floating storage, some degree of uh, shore side storage as well. And I also wanted to highlight that uh, when we look at uh, infrastructure planning itself in Singapore, uh, while bunkering is a good lead demand uh, user uh, for ammonia to some degree, uh, the larger picture of uh, Singapore's energy, national energy needs uh, will also have to play, uh, keep in, uh, in play in terms of uh, some of the storage tank capacity. Uh, besides that, uh, I would say the other learnings that uh, we have is really to see uh, through the uh, studies, uh, the pilot trials, uh, we are able to simulate and model you know, some of the techno-economic uh, projections of uh, the take up of uh, some of this fuel. Uh, we also want to model you know, uh, in terms of uh, the green uh, supply chain, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, if you are burning ammonia from a grey source, it basically uh, does not you know, uh, solve the immediate problem that we want. So really in terms of uh, looking at where uh, the supply chain is, the availability and the green premium, I think those are important pieces uh, that uh, we want to talk, uh, look into. And this is also why being a consumer itself, uh, we typically would not have say access to uh, a fuel producer. So in the Castor initiative, we do also have good access uh, and uh, conversations with uh, Yara. Uh, which is our new producer, you know, to talk about you know some of the trends and developments and expectations uh, of how some of these things will, will pan out. So I would say that there are many good learnings. Of course, the uh, any downside is uh, a lot of time and resources, you know, are, are put into into these discussions. And uh, I, but I think these are actually uh, very good for us to plan ahead uh, to ensure that you know when the moment comes, uh, Singapore is ready, you know, to run ahead uh, together with the industry. Yeah. Thank you so much for for that, Ihan. Uh, I would like to to go to the to the elephant in the room, actually, and uh, placing a question to to both of you. I think uh, uh, many of us uh, and uh, uh, the media, not least, uh, is is concerned about uh, the safe combustion of ammonia, the safe handling of ammonia, the safe bunkering of ammonia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Looking at this from, from a leadership point of view, both of you are, are kind of taking that role. How, uh, how are you, uh, uh, how are you taking on that big elephant in the room right now? What, what are the, uh, where are you in this regard? Because this is a question we receive often uh, and uh, we, are also, um, we, <laughs> it's important that we all have open eyes and there are safety concerns with regards to ammonia, but we also need to have confidence that they can be solved. So um, would you be able to, both of you, share, share some, some, some points on that? Uh, Yihan, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. I can start off first. I, I would say that uh, safety is one of the issues that uh, we have uh, started uh, to look into very much early into, uh, 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 into our assessment uh, process. Uh, we have actually been working with uh, our research center uh, to look at conducting uh, some uh, simulation modeling you know, towards uh, some of the risk factors, risk towards, uh, say, the uh, ammonia leakage. Uh, from the tanks, uh, how it is going to be uh, dispersed into the air, dispersed into the marine environment, uh, what is the mitigating factors, how can we uh, manage the overall risk, uh, especially when Singapore is such a small place, so and, and, and uh, densely uh, populated with a lot of activities. So this, this part is something that uh, we take very seriously in terms of uh, trying to model uh, and scope this as part of those uh, uh, technical as well as uh, safety requirements that we hope you know, to put in place uh, subsequently uh, uh, together with uh, part of uh, our overall uh, approach uh, towards uh, ammonia bunkering. Uh, so that's one element. The other element I would say is also that uh, we have been also working with different stakeholders, including uh, GCMD, uh, MESD on uh, possible uh, bunkering operations activities as well as bunkering sites within Singapore. So there are uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, discussion 
interactions uh, between them and the industry. And in fact, uh, GCMD has also commissioned a study with uh, DNB to look at uh, basically the, uh, some of the guidelines uh, that will be involved uh, in a morning bunkering that uh, they will put up to uh, MPA, you know, for recommendations uh, for us to take into uh, as well. Uh, but uh, this is still not enough. And I think uh, I would say that we are also looking at eventually having some degree of uh, pilots, you know, to move some of this, uh, 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 what do you call that, capability, some of these procedures into reality by having some uh, pilots of maybe uh, some ship to ship uh, cargo tank transfer as a way to build up some of this confidence and some of these capabilities as we uh, await, you know, for uh, the other parts of the uh, process, you know, to, to, to reach its uh, stage of maturity. And this is also where we are very keen, you know, to see how we can bring together people with the same uh, um, needs in, in this area of safety to come together, uh, work with MPA, work with uh, our research partners, you know, to come together uh, to address safety, which I believe is a common issue uh, and common challenge across the board. And uh, we hope that some degree of uh, safety uh, recommendation guidelines and uh, standards can be formed. You know, that's also a good way, you know, to move uh, Ammonia as a, a promising candidate front runner for uh, green fuels uh, to run ahead uh, uh, of other fuels. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Peter, what would you like to say on this topic? Um... It's it's uh, it, it would be easy to say that that it's uh, when we like we talk about the ship that's as far as where we are involved of course but obviously bunkering operations everything need to be in order but when we talk about the ship we look at how is it usually usually done when you introduce a new system and this would be that every maker of each system, engineer a safe system. So basically we would be responsible for the engine, someone else would, we would interface to different systems and then all of the, let's say, then, then each maker sit down and go through every possible scenario in a hazard to see, yeah. well, uh, where are there some interfaces where we might have overlooked something. And with a substance such as ammonia that behaves completely different uh, than, than what we're used to, because usually when we do a hazard, let's say we back a while back now, when this was done for methane, then the, the primary concern is, would you have an, an explosion? Would you have some sort of, of mixture of air and, and methane that, that would ignite or it could combust? Um, with ammonia, it's a bit different. So. Not that we are not going through, let's say we are engineering an engine. We need to make sure that it ammonia stays inside it. We need to make sure that it's safe to, to do maintenance on it. We need to make sure that it combusts all of the ammonia and doesn't let anything out of the stack. All of these things. Um, but it's really in when we're discussing the interface to the other systems of the engine. So let's say from our point of view, it's to the ship. The ship is, of course, many different systems, but having this dialogue repeatedly and with someone in the room who knows that ammonia behaves differently. And this is really where the work um, is happening. Um, of course, every maker out there of each system is I'm very confident that they, they are doing uh, and we are doing everything needed but it's in the interfaces we need to look through. And I think it's the same when you look at the interface, let's say between the ship and the port. Uh, this is where you need to ensure that no misunderstandings are there and everyone, let's say every, how the systems behave across from one another is really understood and, and taken into consideration. I think that's... that's are there are there any transferable learnings, Peter, from e, from LNG operation, or for instance, for from uh, the um, uh, ammonia carriers? Uh, uh, we are in discussion with quite a few uh, very seasoned operators of uh, ammonia carriers, and they know, you know, how, how what are the routines now when you when you pump this sub substance from one tank to the other, etc. But putting it in the engine room or in the ship's engine room casing is really what is new. 
Um, but here we have a lot of learnings, not only from 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 LNG as fuel, but methanol as well. Methanol being a toxic substance, of course, not it doesn't behave the same way as as ammonia, far from it. But but still, this is uh, where we have some learnings from the other fuels that where where we basically took a, a new substance and and introduced it to an engine room, and an engine room needs to be engineered in a way so that the crew can work there every day. It's really a, a big factor that, that we you, this is the workplace of, of a ship's crew. Are you able to take in any feedback from um, people from working at sea? Um, of course. <laughs> and that's where we, th they have seen all the scenarios that can happen with uh, when one or other factors are there that we obviously, after all, are an engine designer. We don't see that happening in our test facility. Uh, of course, we operational feedback is a large part of our uh, R and D. Yeah. So which sure. scenarios do we need to prepare for? What is expected of an engine when it it's running, but also when it's stopped? Thank you. Um... We've received quite some questions on the Castor initiative, especially. So I will try and pose some of them to you now, Peter. Um, uh, we have um, we have a question regarding the the, the bore size uh, and the MCR for the engine on the Castor project, and uh, very specifically the type of tank that is targeted and the specific fuel consumption. Would you have anything to say on that? Um, these are very detailed questions. Yeah. Uh, but the Castor Initiative is working around the idea of a very large crude oil carrier. So uh, a VLCC, and usually those engines are around uh, 20, well, 23,000 uh, kilowatts and seven cylinder G80 engines. But uh, that's that's a VLCC specification. I'm just, <laughs> yeah. let's say, handing over. It's, what the Castor Initiative is doing is, of course, also up to the builder and up to, um, to the ship owner ordering that ship. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. I, I will bring us back, back up again uh, with, with uh, one of my questions regarding uh, how the... Um, the maritime energy shift and combined with the digital revolution that we have been part of, uh, how that has actually created quite the acceleration of maritime uh, entrepreneurs and startups. Um, and we, we, we see a lot of uh, such activity and, and innovations in this regard. And so my question to both of you would be um, uh, with, with the needs you have both expressed, to, to collaborate and, and, and co-develop uh, impact solutions. Um, what kind of advice could you give to startups out there so that uh, they uh, are better prepared um, to, to bring their ideas uh, to you? Um, it, they yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I, I would say that uh, there's a lot of good opportunity on innovations uh, in the maritime decarbonization space uh, uh, of course one track that uh, we typically see is really uh, digital innovation digital technologies that helps to enhance uh, the operations uh, with a view that you you have better enhanced tracking measurements with and and uh, with view that you can optimize and reduce some of your carbon uh, footprint through uh, operational efficiency. Uh, the other track uh, is something that uh, we are also trying to encourage and uh, engage more startups, which is in terms of uh, uh, fuel innovation, in terms of say the use of uh, uh, certain uh, fuel combination technology to. Uh, enhance the combustion uh, or even to say uh, look at uh, um, things like uh, 
fuel cell kind of technologies that uh, say runs on uh, hydrogen or ammonia. Uh, some of the advice I would say uh, to some of the technologies or startups are really more from, from the angle that if you're not from the maritime industry, don't be too worried, you know, that uh, there's no space for you to play. I think some of these technologies could be cross-pollinated uh, or adapted in a way that uh, has previously been used uh, in other uh, uh, industries or domain. Uh, I, I guess uh, if you go from the earlier uh, questions relating to safety, you know, if we, if uh, the likes of uh, using uh, good uh, IoT sensors uh, uh, that will help to enhance uh, safety and tracking, things along those lines will be quite uh, useful and quite a good start, especially when we look at uh, ammonia and its uh, toxicity as uh, some of the key factors uh, that people are thinking about. Uh, the other part uh, in terms of advice to them will really be uh, to participate in some of those uh, maritime community uh, uh, platforms. Uh, what we have in MPA is the Singapore Maritime Week, which is held in April every year. Uh, so there will be players, uh, both from the demand side and also the technologies, uh, who can shed insights on uh, the latest trends in terms of uh, decarbonization technologies, uh, as well as the decarbonization uh, policies and drivers. So then you, uh, we can bring them into uh, some of the challenge statements that the industries are sponsoring to provide them with an opportunity to demonstrate uh, proof of concepts of how they can uh, use their technologies or technologies that they've adapted from somewhere else to be used in the maritime domain. So, so I, I, uh, that will be the two advice I, I have for the uh, startups. Super, thank you. And Peter, would you have anything there to, to say with regards to those who, who are maybe targeting the ammonia energy envelope uh, in that regard? I mean, for me, it's really a, a difficult one thinking, well, what we do is our core competence in the end is engine design and combustion. Um, and, and we're breaking new ground here. So everything would be new. It would be very interesting to hear from, uh, yeah. of course, uh, from startups. But I really think Ian is onto something when it comes to, uh, let's say, adapting a technology that can be used for uh, monitoring or even, uh, let's say, enhance the safety. And I think especially surrounding the, once you have the ship in port or, or let's say, operating at a terminal, then, then you, I think there's a lot of space for some new technologies there or some new context to be made with existing technologies. Yeah. I actually had my, my next question was actually what are the critical technological or economic capabilities which we need to develop now? And so that, that goes quite well in hand with that. Um, uh, would you have anything to add there, Jihan, when you think about the capabilities we need to develop that can be of inspiration to, to innovators out there? Uh, yeah, so on, uh, on this part in terms of... Uh capabilities and technologies. I think what we are working on uh, quite a bit is really to be able to model and simulate uh, the, the fuel uh, and the dispersion uh, uh, in the context of uh, uh, environments such as in Singapore, uh, where it's uh, more uh, warm, humid, and we wanted to understand uh, how the dynamics of some of these things uh, would happen. Uh, we are also taking this opportunity as we move into new ships, new, new ammonia, new anchors uh, that are being designed uh, to also look at uh, creating uh, digital twins uh, of some of these new uh, ships designs and systems so that uh, we can have continuous uh, uh, monitoring improvements uh, that can be made uh, uh, more efficiently. Uh, some of this uh, would, have, would build up a, a new capability within the maritime sector uh, in the areas of uh, using uh, digital and simulation uh, to to enhance uh, and optimize operations. So I would say this will be some of the key areas that uh, we are actually moving uh, quite a lot into. Thank you for that. Um, now I'm scrolling through the questions we have received. <laughs> um, one question uh, here. Um, when we look at ammonia as a fuel, we are, of course, looking into the, the long-term uh, vision of using renewable ammonia to achieve uh, zero carbon emissions. We also know, however, that the engines will need um, some pilot fuel. 
Would you be able to elaborate on that, Peter, and where you are in the development of that? Um, yes. So the engine we're developing is a dual fuel engine, meaning it can run ammonia on, on ammonia, and it can run on conventional fuels. There, there's a, a few technical reasons for why this is a good idea, um, and as in ammonia mode, we're using a pilot fuel, and this is uh, basically to to start and to control the combustion uh, in the diesel cycle. So, and and in this first iteration of the engine, this pilot fuel is possible. Well, could be bio, but it's basically uh, a diesel oil. Um, obviously, it would be interesting to see if you can substitute this with something else down the road. Um, but for the two-stroke engines, we are looking at a 5% uh, pilot, which is uh, okay. quite... <laughs> That's quite small. Quite small, and, and considering if the other 95% of the fuel is green ammonia, then that reduction is enormous. Not saying that it shouldn't... Uh, we, should, we will not be pushed on this, and we need to push this. And that could be on having a smaller pilot amount or having a different uh, media than oil as the pilot. Um, hydrogen? Oh. Hydrogen Hydrogen is, is a, technically a very difficult substance to handle. Yeah. yeah. And hydrogen, even though it's, it's, it's very good at promoting ignition, um, yeah. it's also a lot of nice shiny valves and technical things to put on an engine just to start a combustion of ammonia. It might be more, again, down the line, uh, if you could look at a DME or a biofuel uh, to use as, as the pilot, that might be more economical in the end. Um, but let's see where it goes. I mean, uh, so far we are, we are in the early days of these engines. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, challenging you then on, on another technicality. Uh, what are the um, learnings so far with the, the um, lubrication um, situation? Uh, I mean, um, I assume that there will need, be need of some innovation in what kind of lubrication fuels we will uh, um, have for these engines? Are the, can you share anything on that? Um, basically, when we talk two-stroke engines and, and lubrication, we have sort of three concerns. And, and one is the system oil, which is in the crank house, uh, crank case. Uh, this is on a two-stroke crosshead engine separated. If you have ammonia there, then there's something else wrong. So it's not really an operational concern. It's That's much more of a safety concern. That's not a, a, a case we're looking at. Uh, for the oil, at least. Um, then we have the cylinder loop oil. Uh, for cylinder loop oil, uh, it basically does two things. It makes sure that the combustion chamber parts are clean, namely the piston rings, uh, and it makes sure to neutralize any sulfur you might have from the fuel. When you're looking at ammonia, you're not likely to have any sulfur or, or anything corrosive you need to deal with. So this means the oils cylinder oil's primary job is to keep the piston ring pack clean from combustion residue. Uh, and this is actually the same case as we see on the LNG engines, that there's not a lot of, uh, of acid that you need to deal with, but you still need to keep the piston rings clean. So for now, until we are much further in our mm -hmm. testing, it looks like these, uh, what are, are called category two cylinder loop oils, uh, will be able to do the job. But again, uh, once we have more experience with running these engines, then, then we will know. But, but for now, that's where we are. Then the third part is lubrication of, uh, let's say, the an injection valve where the media in, inside the valve is ammonia. Um, whereas a, a normal injection valve would have heavy fuel oil or some sort of oil in it. Um, but here we have a, at least a baseline with our methanol engines, which also use, uh, that, or which 
have valves where the media inside them is methanol and methanol is not exactly a good lubricant and this is sort of our baseline this is where we start that we have now a media inside a valve which is not a good lubricant um, and we'll sort of start with using the same principles as we have made work on our methanol engines thank you for that lecture peter <laughs> <laughs> um we have five minutes to go um and so uh we need to start rounding up and uh, so perhaps taking this um uh on a on a positive note nevertheless but if you could um, from any kind of perspective technological economic regulatory whatever if you can select one key challenge that you are going to solve in the next coming period six months or a year what is that peter one key challenge um i think for the one key challenge will be to prove this concept so once we have an engine running then okay here are the safety measures that were needed at this stage and then Th that's a very good starting point for really starting to um, to stop the concerns around safety, uh, and that will also, uh, I'm sure, kickstart uh, or, or have a very positive influence on on the discussions around fuel supply. Um, yeah. Once you've seen it work, that's uh, that's usually a good catalyst. Yes. Thank you, Ihan. What would you say to that? What is the key challenge that you're going to solve in the next period? Um, okay, so I, I guess uh, as a regulator itself, uh, uh, the lever that we, we will have is more in the regulatory space. So I think that is some area that we'll be definitely working very hard, uh, you know, to, to have a sense of uh, the developments, the challenges, the requirements, so that uh, when we do regulate, we regulate it uh, smartly uh, with a view that, you know, it is uh, uh, enabling some of this innovation and some of this uh, progress uh, to take place. But in terms of time frame itself, uh, I don't think I can commit within a six-month time frame. It's something <laughs> that I think is a conversation that we will continue to have. It's something that uh, we're working very uh, hard on it. We are also trying to leverage on uh, previous experiences that we have, uh, say for example, when we were building up the LNG uh, bunkering uh, regulations and ecosystem. So some of these are good learning points. Uh, and of course, uh, we welcome more conversations like this, you know, so that uh, we can bounce some ideas, bounce off some of these needs so that uh, uh, we can collectively, you know, move together uh, quickly uh, and more effectively as one whole big community. Thank you. Uh, so challenging you once again, both of you, if you can come up with three key words that you would like our audience to take with them from your message here today, what, what would they be? Peter, would you like to start? I would say collaboration is needed and it is happening. Fantastic. Yihan. Yeah, I was going to say about collaboration, but uh, let, 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 um, I, I would say that uh, we also should have uh, the confidence and the drive. Uh, I think uh, we shall not just look at the, the hurdles and the no's, but we should try to see how we can piece together all the yes, all the LS has been working and trying to get uh, ourselves uh, forward to make uh, ammonia uh, uh, a reality, uh, you know, uh, alternative uh, for the maritime sector in, in, in this space. Yeah. Sorry, I think I, I, I used more than one word. That was great. <laughs> that was great. And, and, and to the audience out there who, who are, uh, not happy that I didn't pick up on their questions. Um, you, I apologize, and you have an opportunity to 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 reach out to to the AEA directly for 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 further uh, elaboration on that. But so, um, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Johan, for joining us today. Thank you to to the audience who who uh, signed up for today and and listened through, and for all the great questions. Um, remember uh, the presentations and the recording and a write-up will be available on our website and take note of the 15th of September where we invite uh, Itochu to speak about their joint safety study and the bunkering project. Um, so uh, I think I'm on time. 
Um, thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day or, or a great evening ahead. Thank you.